they we have the intervention by uh, Stephanie Luz and uh, Vincent Kikio. We welcome them and we really thank for their availability to to bring uh, uh, all their knowledge and their experience uh, uh, to our uh, initiative. Uh, I give now the floor to Antonella Contin, who was the main promoter of this uh, relation with uh, between Politecnico and UN Habitat for a short presentation. Thanks, Antonella. Uh, grazie, Sara. Very few words because I don't want to consume the precious time of our guest. Uh, I, I would like to introduce uh, Stephanie Luz. Um, uh, I, I, I guess I have the, uh, her CV uh, on my screen. Uh, she's the responsible of the program for Burkina Faso in, the, in, in Sahel. You know how relevant will be this uh, area also for Europe uh, and in the plan of our uh, government uh, in, in Europe. So it's really a hot uh, place and, and target. Uh, she, is, uh, uh, she was uh, and she's a focal point for the work on migration and displacement, supporting program development for migration and cities. Um, but to introduce Stephanie Lowe's, uh, that uh, she's an architect, uh, a German architect, but uh, probably in some cases uh, she seems uh, quite Italian, also for the, her passion and uh, her engagement with local community, with women in local community. And for me, she was, since the first time that I met her in Berlin, uh, a sort of example of uh, how a woman could teach with her uh, example, with the, with the way, with the attitude uh, that she used uh, in relationship to her work and in relationship to the, the people for which and uh, with which uh, she is working. And that for me was... Um, uh, uh, also relevant because uh, uh, I was able to understand uh, uh, the other phase uh, of the huge multilaterals that are made by people, uh, people that have their life and, uh, and that spend uh, a lot of their time trying to understand other cultures uh, instead to promote uh, the traditional capitalism, patriarchal uh, and colonialism attitude. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Stephanie, uh, to join us. Uh, uh, today I ask uh, Stephanie uh, to speak about uh, Echo. I, I'm very happy that there is Lina Malfona with us today because uh, Lina, she's an architect and uh, uh, her topic of research uh, is uh, how is it possible to build community starting from the physical dimension? So there are a lot of topics that uh, uh, you could share uh, between Lina and Stephanie. Um, uh, so I ask uh, uh, Stephanie uh, to develop one of the main statements that I learned from her job, the, the, the necessity to uh, include uh, into the, the city, into the life of the city and the physical space of the city, working a lot on public space and try to understand what does it mean public space for the different community. We work together in Africa, for example. So her work was uh, uh, to develop a methodology that allow us to understand other culture in the way in which they built their space. That is a connection between morphological issue, but also a cultural issue, tangible and intangible. And uh, uh, without, uh, uh, not to take into consideration the fact that uh, the daily life uh, is also market, uh, 
uh, economy uh, in the etymological sense, so habitus way in which we live and we exchange and pass our, our time. So uh, thank you very much, Stephanie, and the floor uh, is for you. Thank you again. Okay, thanks a lot. Let me know if you can actually hear me or if there's any problem when I speak, it's all fine. Um, those are really flattening words. <laughs> thanks a lot, Antonella, and I really hope I meet your expectations. Um, but, you know, maybe, maybe it's true that being uh, first of all, a migrant myself um, in many places, and then maybe also being a woman in societies where there's also um, where there's still a lot of, I don't know, let's say cultural tradition of patriotism is also maybe also very much shaping my own perspective and my efforts to not come in as, you know, s with a top down approach, but actually really trying to understand what people feel. And I mean, I don't always succeed because I'm constantly learning because of course I come in with my own perspective um, and my own life experiences. And so actually the most important thing I'm always learning is stepping back and trying to understand what other people actually feel like. Maybe Sarah, if you could start sharing the presentation and then, um, I would propose I go through the presentation rather fast, so maybe 15 minutes, maybe a bit longer. Um, and then if there are any questions, we go back to individual slides. Um, so that, you know, I'm not taking a lot of Vincent's time either, because I think uh, Vincent's and my presentation show two very different um, perspectives and, and work streams of UN Habitat. And, um, I, I'm also very interested to learn from what Vincent will actually um, present. So, okay, let's start with uh, the first slide. Yeah. Um, so, as Antonella said, so my presentation is on inclusive cities for inclusive societies, um, the importance of migrants inclusion before, during, and post COVID. Um, and you'll see in the presentation, I'm not really sure we're in the post COVID uh, yet. So, I'm mainly concentrating trading on the before and during and just giving a very small outlook on what could be necessary to shape a more inclusive post-COVID um, perspective. Well, I'm speaking to you as you're working in um, on and in Piacenza. I understand many of you are actually coming from different contexts, but of course in Italy, I mean, the, the question around migrants inclusion um, is like also really a, a very prominent one. Um, only like in in, um, in this year, um, UNRCR has counted 36,000 migrants that arrived via sea, and I'm not speaking about all the others. So, um, who have come via land ways. And of course, you know, um, many find their, well, livelihood in agricultural sections. But, and I know um, everybody living in Italy actually knows that many of them are in urban areas. Next. So, um, I first want to maybe go a bit into the details of the term migrants, because that is really sort of important. There are migrants which come in with papers in a regular way. Um, there are migrants that are refugees, so they have a specific legal status in Europe. And then there is a lot of undocumented um, migrants. So I would kindly raise awareness that we don't ever use the word irregular, um, well, irregular people. No one is irregular, but it might be that someone's immigration status is maybe irregular. So it's rather the status than the person itself, which I think is the first important step. Um, but just really maybe, you know, while everybody in the media always speaks about, you know, all of those African, all of those Asian people coming into, into Italy, coming into Europe, um, I really want to highlight the fact that most migration within Europe is from other European countries. And I think that is actually um, a really important statement I want to make, even though the media makes us think it's really the other way around. So, um, I also really want to raise awareness that migrants contribute to our societies. So um, it's 
really important that we acknowledge this fact and it's often left behind as i said again specifically when media draws attention to um, the big problems of migrants but honestly just imagine all of our societies without migrants without those people working in the fields without um, if you can go back a slide that makes it a bit easier um, with all the people working on the construction side in the kitchens in the restaurant and specifically you know taking care of others next slide that means, um, just to give you some numbers, um, in Luxembourg and Australia, more than 50% of doctors are foreign-born. Uh, foreign and in London, as we recognized also in the COVID crisis, two-thirds of nurses were migrants, and some of them saved Boris Johnson. So it is really important to understand that um, our economies wouldn't work without migrants and specifically those low skilled and low paid sectors, the slow put sectors um, wouldn't work at all, which as I'm speaking about, you know, care service, support services, the food chain, but also simply simple jobs in um, waste management on the one hand, but then really also crucial jobs like in IT as doctors and um, with a high qualification as well. Next slide. One of the challenges I actually see that um, the term migrant is not clearly defined in minds and that a lot of the social exclusion is actually strongly towards those migrants that have an irregular migration status and that come, like for example, without their families or that come as people in vulnerable situations. That means without a lot of money. And some of the challenges that they're facing is, of course, that they are in constant fear of deportation. That means you have to imagine living a life constantly wondering if you use any sort of services, you might just be reported and then um, deported. They already, because of that fear, they have limited access to services. And that is the next point I'm really going to go for, but stay on this slide, please, is that they sometimes can't access services which we all take for granted. I'm speaking about wash services, I'm speaking about education, I'm speaking about health services, which is bust in the COVID, um, in the COVID years has become even more visible and crucial. And also their living environments are really dear. So most of those who are in vulnerable situations, they, you know, don't have adequate living situations. They are spatially included and they live in environments where, well, which are definitely inadequate. So um, next slide. Another point that of course I mentioned is the language barrier, which many of them face. So what you sort of see on this slide um, is a picture, a mapping from Médecins Sans Frontières from 2018, where they look at how migrants and refugees live in Italy. And, um, well, it's actually quite sad to see that um, in many cities in Italy, which is a really developed country, um, the living conditions of migrants and refugees are rather inhumane. There's a very good report, and I can also share the, the mission to that um, report because I think it's really important to be aware of the spatial dimension of exclusion. Next slide. What do I mean with the spatial exclusion? Um, I have to say that um, it's also urban poor in many cases that face the main challenges, but as I said, people in vulnerable situations, they often live in areas which are underserviced and unconnected. So if you don't have a public bus system from where you live, how do you actually reach work um, if you don't have, you know, a public bus or any other means of transport, not even a bicycle? How do you get to a doctor in case needed, you know? Um, so it's this sort of accessibility which is a problem um accessing the accessing the services on the one hand but also of course accessing the employment opportunities and then of course there is this other component the social one that 
if migrants are sort of being pushed out of sight, that actually includes the xenophobia in reaction. And um, if the media starts reporting all of the time about male migrants um, being on the road, being in the city, increasing the insecurity, being a threat to women, girls, that really is one element of it. But then if people don't have the possibility in public spaces, as Antonella said, um, in public spaces to interact and have personal connections with migrants, the problem actually gets accelerated. Um, so, of course, and, and I already said, it's the indecent living conditions and even worse, it's also a lot of migrants or people in vulnerable situation actually living on the road. And there is a picture on the slide before, um, no, yeah, of a situation in Italy, the one on top. And I mean, I think you all know that many migrants in Italy are actually, well, and so don't have any access to housing at all. Which is, of course, impacting their safety. It's impacting gender-based violence, but it's also strongly impacting um, mental health. COVID-19, um, as I said, has really um, made the situation worse because it's it's um, it has brought to light the the inequalities the inequalities in living conditions. If you cannot do social distancing where you live, well, how do you stay home then? And on the other hand, also when you need health services and you cannot access them because you are afraid of being deported, that is really a very horrible situation in a pandemic. Next slide. Just naming some of the health impacts as said, of course, the indecent living conditions, the overcrowdedness, um, no way to do physical distancing, no access maybe to water and sanitation for, you know, washing hands, and the additional point, having a language barrier for understanding the information provided already is one point. Then many migrants are actually not even daring to go and consult health services because they're we being afraid of the deportation. And then if you don't have any housing at all, that is actually an even higher problem, also including the risk of gender-based violence, as I said. Next slide. There are, of course, for migrants, there's also been a lot of impacts when it comes to the economic surrounding because most migrants in vulnerable situations, so with irregular migration status, they work in the formal economy. And if they work in the in the no, they work in the informal economy. If they work in the formal economy, they often don't have formal contracts. So if anybody loses their job, people in vulnerable situations are the first ones, and then they don't have any social network or any social safety net to pick them up. So there are some numbers on this slide which will be shared with you um, on how many people actually lost their jobs and how the rate of foreign workers actually dropped. and. The point I also wanted to mention is that, of course, when migrant workers lose their jobs, that also impacts the families in the places of origin. If they don't have jobs anymore, they cannot print. So there's a whole circle around it. Next slide. I said there's also social impacts of um, COVID-19. Of course, you know, there's a lot of um, discrimination because, well, migrants have been seen as the origin of COVID-19. They have been seen as spreading the virus. They have been seen as like, you know, because they're constantly traveling, they're bringing in all sorts of, um, all sorts of maladies, which is actually, you know, um, putting a blame on someone who is not to blame for. The second point is that a lot of services that were tailored for migrants actually been re reduced, so social support services, and but also with schools closed, as we've seen in Europe, quite many countries, of course, those people who might need additional support are falling behind. They might not have access to online schooling systems. They might not have access to uh, additional language courses, all those sort of things. So it will also impact very strongly the, the next generation of migrants. Over. Uh, next slide. 
as I said, for me, it's really difficult to actually looking at this map to say we're already in a post COVID situation, numbers are going up again. Um, so I rather, instead of speaking about post COVID situation, I'll rather next slide. Um, try to highlight some points on the COVID-19 crisis as an opportunity for more inclusive societies because there has, in this crisis situation, really been a lot of efforts taken from all different stakeholders to focus on improving migrant situation. And so I just want to give some examples that I hope, even though they've been done during the COVID-19 crisis, that actually they will continue to, to influence policies and also response. Um, just to mention it, of course, there are two main global frameworks, the Global Compact for Safe, Regular and Ordered Migration, GCM, and the Global Compact on Refugees. Then there is, of course, for cities, the new agenda. And all of those actually really promote the whole of government, the whole of society and people-centered inclusive approaches. So let me just explain whole of government. Um, that means that we're having vertical and horizontal cohesion. Whole of society means civil society, private sector, academia, everybody included in decision-making processes. And it also means that inclusive approaches means pa active participation of those in vulnerable situations. As UN Habitat, we have a different point actually to add. And I think, you know, speaking about the spatial inclusion before, it's an area-based approach that which is urgently needed in urban areas because, as I said, um, people in vulnerable situations, they sort of face the same challenges if they live in an unserviced, unconnected quartier or tourist city. Um, so instead of focusing on specific people, you actually have to do a lot to improve living condition in the entire quartier, so it will actually benefit all people. Um, if there are any questions on this, happy to come back on this later. So, some examples, next slide. Some examples of good practices that we've seen actually regarding a whole of government approach, um, cross governance cooperation, where national leaders and local actors have really work together to support migrants. And for example, in Spain, undocumented workers now during the COVID pandemic have access to public health services and education. In Canada and France, they have like countrywide um, adopted special residency permits, which actually, you know, actually include migrants into the pandemic response. And also at local level, and those will be the next slide, there have been some really innovative examples of local authorities taking over responsibilities and including migrants in their cities. And this is why I mentioned it, some actually contradiction with what their national level laws actually require them to do, which I think is quite exceptional. Next slide. Not, not that I'm promoting that, of course, but I mean, I think cities have been really innovative in this, um, in this approach. So I'll go very fast through those slides because it's a lot of examples of cities from all over the world. So Milan has a real long-term city resilient, resilience strategy for long-term inclusion. Um, the city of Sao Paulo has really made sure that um, people in vulnerable situations are included in services and have provided additional services like food, cash assistance, and have um, really engaged in emergency housing. In Barcelona, they have created something that we call one-stop shops, where um, shops where actually migrants can get access and of information, but also services really across the different sectors regarding legal advice, regarding medical advice, regarding social advice, all in one place, which is a very good measure to build up trust. Freetown has a COVID-19 preparedness and response plan, which is actually very much targeted of rural urban migrants and giving them employment. And of course, Athens um, that has well faced a very, very strong influx of additional people also have very strong um, component and a strategic plan for inclusion. Next slide. 
Gion Habitat is, of course, also standing there and always putting housing in the center. Because if I look at, um, well, if I look at the protection side of things, I mean, the first thing that everybody sort of needs is a safe place to stay. And so housing for us is really one of the one of the things that is in the center of our attention. And there are some city authorities that have really come up with innovative solutions for migrants, including migrants with irregular um, migration statuses, like opening up empty apartments or public facilities to migrants. Uh, opening universities, which have actually been closed, so university campuses, to um, migrants that have arrived in their cities, or vacant hotels in a lot of locations where um, where tourism has actually like gone down because of my because of COVID. And then there are other cities where, where actually in like Malaga in Spain, uh, which have come up with a rental subsidy program, working together with land and housing owners but also you know, providing them with some sort of security that if they take in migrants, whenever their um, rent is not being paid, there is an additional, there is an additional support around those things. Next slide. That was specifically on housing, but of course there are also similar examples and just as many um, when it comes to the access to services, like I said, in Portugal, it's not the national level, but it's actually cities all, all over Portugal that have established a specific citizen card, um, which is also, you know, like in um, New York and Grenoble, that is something that's been provided so people can access those services. Um, there's the third point about firewalls, Mitch Schneid, some additional uh, explanation. That means that, for example, if you consult a health service, that means you can do it in a way that you don't have to fear that your data or the information on you as a person is actually provided to immigration services. So that means the installation of firewalls between immigration services and health services, for example. And there are many other examples like Rome having created a special pass or um, also a special, you know, a special program, um, how to go around existing legislation. So they're, they're quite some interesting examples. Um, and we can go back if you have additional questions. So there are more on the next slide, there are even more examples and I will not go through them now because I think it's better to have an interactive discussion instead of me just talking. But in the presentation, next slide, there are actually quite some, some examples um, that you can also rely on and do more research. Another thing I really want to mention is that during the COVID response, a lot of cities, but also national governments, built up um, partnerships that they were not used to have. So that means, first of all, this um, cooperation across government levels uh, is actually very new in some country contexts, but also the work with, um, next slide, sorry. The work with um, local associations, with NGO, and also for cities to work directly with international organizations, be it from humanitarian, but also from development organizations is quite new and quite innovative, including that, you know, um, including the financing, which can now in many cases go directly to cities and not only to local, uh, to inter international level government. So I think something that is also really important has been cooperation with academia. So I am always very grateful to work with the team because I think it's so important, the role of academia for collecting data, but also to to come up with pilot solutions, which might not be the usual, the usual one fits all. Um, and well, specifically in Antonella's, um, where we've worked together, um, the Polytechnical team really has always brought in this very spatial component and this planning component, which helps us to open the minds for reducing any sort of spatial inclusion in cities. And of course, like there are others like city to city partnerships, like private sector inclusion for finding solutions. And also, I think that is something that we've seen is quite exceptional. That 
solidarity between those communities and migrants is in many situations and well it's also because there's one important sentence that the um secretary general of the united nations said in one of his briefings no one is safe until everyone is safe regarding COVID. next slide I said I cannot speak about um, post-COVID at the moment, but I can, of course, give some, some glances of what we think was really important during the COVID response, response and we hope that this will like, continue. Um, it's about the integrated multi-level and cross-sectoral governance approaches. It's about, you know, thinking out of the box when it comes to partnerships. It's pushing forward for inclusive policies for me, a really important point is changing the narrative and well, making the media change the narrative about migrants. Um, and then also, of course, you know, from a planning perspective, making sure cities are more resilient to all kinds of shocks, including um, a rapid influx of people on the one hand, but also making sure that living conditions actually are possible point that is always well for me it's very much in my heart and and Antonella knows it it's the gender dimension of migration because 54 percent of um, all migrants in Europe are actually women women and girls so there is a special gender regarding gender violence in all phases of the migration but of course um, women in many cases still earn less and are still not being treated equal and you know for for women in vulnerable situations because of their migration status those things are even worse and then of course we discuss and i hope we'll discuss further on this now the spatial dimension of migrants x but then also the spatial dimension of migrants inclusion in cities which i hope is actually well is going to move forward in future as well that's it Thanks a lot and I'm very open for questions. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, thank you very much uh, um, for this very uh, all comprehensive, comprehensive uh, uh, picture of the what does it mean to include uh, migrant and uh, uh, which kind of uh, solution uh, is possible to find out uh, along the world. Uh, for us, uh, as uh, architect and urban planner, that is for our students, uh, uh, what we have to do working uh, in a sort of simulation, what's happening when we work with uh, experts such as uh, Stephanie, our uh, duty is uh, to be able to interpret this reality and understand which could be the set and the scene where all these uh, uh, good practices uh, could happen. So I think that that is uh, the role of uh, our uh, discipline and our uh, knowledge. Try to uh, Francois Chouet named it intersomaticity, so the capability to build uh, a place where it's possible that uh, the migrant could uh, have uh, a easy relationship with health uh, without a fear, so a, a friendly place where they can go if they have some illness. Uh, uh, so change, for example, our idea regarding the typology of the hospital, uh, try to understand uh, uh, what does it mean public space for different culture, a place where they can represent their way of, of living, uh, etc. So uh, even though um, uh, the, the, the competencies that uh, Stephanie present uh, as seems uh, uh, not related to the physical dimension, I do think that uh, for us it's fundamental to understand uh, which could be, it's fundamental to define not only the physical consistency of our project, but also try to see in advance which kind of practices our project uh, 
could uh, promote uh, and uh, and um, define so that we can also start a, a dialogue with the policymaker civil servant uh, because we uh, produce a sort of meta project that allow the policymaker to understand which kind of sector needs an improvement of uh, uh, public policies, for example. Um, I don't know, and I ask Sarah and Sarah um, if we would like to start uh, directly with the second lecture and then open the arena for the question. I guess that probably is better. What do you think? Uh, yeah, it's a bit also up to Vincent because uh, I didn't receive yet the material he sent me, and I'm not sure if it's with us now. Because before I have admitted him, because probably he lost his connection. Mm -hmm. but now... Yeah, I, I think he's uh, experiencing some connection. No, issues. he is uh, of apparently is connected. Mm. Right now, yes. So uh, probably we can, uh, in any case, in any case, uh, open uh, the question and answer time, waiting for the because he's in Cameroon. Uh, he told us uh, with a um, hurricane or a rain, <laughs> a very huge rain uh, that was coming. Uh, so. Uh, probably we can uh, open the floor for a uh, question. Um, I, I really hope that someone would like to break the, uh, the ice and, and start, uh, uh, uh reacting, uh, with that, uh, uh, uh lecture. Uh, there is Valentina that raised uh, her hand, so maybe she yeah, wants to I, I see. Guys? <laughs> Probably. Yeah, I have um, just one consideration. Um, before we start, thank you, Stephanie, for your presentation. It was super interesting and for me, a reflection to what we are trying to build with the NMS Lab with Professor Contin. So you gave us different kind of information, uh, but also patterns of um, let's say, uh, knowledge that probably we can apply on the ground field of action in our projects. So thank you very much. And I was also thinking about that, um, considering uh, the special paradigms on social marginalization and uh, special injustice, that is an interesting concept in which I'm studying, uh, in different international contexts that you uh, have shown us, I was particularly um, attracted by the first map that you showed us uh, of the main multi-ethnic migration hotspots in Italy. And I was wondering how it is possible to accurately map a specific phenomenon and condition where there is a scarcity of data, uh, especially in some places in which it's emergence to, to act or to play uh, a strategy on the local field of action. For instance, knowing my personal experience uh, um, in the topical case of Taranto, that, that is the city in which I was born, um, Taranto is a port of is city ports of great flow and outflow uh, of migrants that are actually engaged in the informal economy, especially in the agricultural work field of action. And my question is, uh, uh, and I saw that on the map it was, was absent, and my consideration was why? And probably my answer is that probably we know why. So the my question is, how would it be possible to map a phenomena uh, of migration and special injustice when the census data are insufficient or illegally concealed uh, or disappeared in the in our national or regional data set? What is the UN habitat approach in this sense and how you can help us to investigate on this sense in specific context that we don't know? I try to answer in a non-political way. <laughs> <laughs> Because uh, you know, uh, first of all, I'm I'm not a specialist on the Italian um, on the Italian context. I have to be honest. And the map that I showed was actually from um, uh, Médecins Sans Frontières, and I think it's amazing actually that an organization like Médecins Sans Frontières is working on this spatial dimension or is including the spatial dimension in their 
in their considerations. I think that already by the fact I was so positively surprised by that. Um, I don't know where they got their data from. So regarding the map I had in the presentation, I honestly, I really don't know. Um, it's from 2018. So I don't know if, you know, maybe the problem wasn't so bad in 2018. Maybe they just focused on some regions um, or some cities in those regions. I mean, in the end, I think they, they evaluated the situation of, I don't know. So really for the data on this map, I don't know. What I do know is that there is often very little data um, about, well, about those migrants with irregular migration statuses because they also don't want to be found. They don't want to be mapped. I mean, honestly, if you fear deportation, would you like someone coming around saying, oh, hi, I'm trying to map you. Where do you actually live? Um, so it, it just won't happen. And I mean, in, in Europe, the database is actually really, really good. While honestly, in a lot of other countries, um, it's specifically in those poor urban areas where there's no data available on not migrants, not IDPs, not refugees, not urban poor, because they're simply not mapped. And there are organizations that have specialized on this um so we're working with with specific partners like for example gyps which is the joint profiling service which have also a very strong spatial component we're working with partners like reach which is part of the urban settlements um, engagement um and they also have like a partner organization which is called agora so i can give you a couple of names and and share some reports on how this has been done but it's always very delicate, specifically for those people which are not in, in regular um, situations. And then the second point is also, um, I mean, in urban areas, this is what I said before, we strongly promote the area-based approach because in the end, you know, like um, if services are available and they are migrants inclusive, then instead of, creating activities just specifically for a certain group of people rather improve the access to those services for all because then it doesn't create more social tension than you know uh, the than there is already and the last point i want to mention when it comes to data collection my colleagues in lebanon have actually done quite a lot of good profilings around this and what they told me is that they work a lot with um, data, which is not directly related, but for example, they measure the amount of waste in a neighborhood. And so based on this data, they can actually then recalculate how many people are living in this neighborhood, even those which are not formally registered. Or, you know, I mean, with, with um, big data, you can also use like the number of phones being connected in, in um, specific areas, which also gives you an indication of the number of people, even though in, in some, um, some quartier, the problem is that, you know, like um, representatives of governments wouldn't even like dare to go anymore. So this is why those alternative data collection um, tools are actually being used. I hope that answers your question, sorry. Yeah, sure. Thank you very much, Stephanie. Other question or comment? I, if I can. Grazie, Lina. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I, um, I would like to really thank you for your uh, very interesting presentation. And there is something that I really appreciate in your approach. Um, I mean, this uh, relationship between the individual and the collective space, which is like the individual space, um, according to your vision, is like the starting point, you know, to, to develop kind of collective uh, programs. And also there was something uh, about your 
PowerPoint to your presentation where you said uh, understanding the special dimension of migrants inclusion. I think that this is a very good practice, a very good suggestion for us as architects because we are interested in space, you know? And, and so I want to ask you if you were referring to the space of um, like this, the space of segregation or you were referring to other kind of spaces. I mean, what, uh, uh, according to your vision, can be this uh, um, special dimension of migrant inclusion? So one is, for example, that as you know, um, the, that, for example, they're living in areas, migrants or people in vulnerable situations. Let me put it like this. You know, they live, of course, in areas where. Um, where there's maybe no public transport connection, or they also, you know, like, of course, face discrimination um, in public spaces. So it does actually, I, I'm speaking about spaces, urban spaces in general, because it, it has different elements. Um, so, for example, I mean, of course, if you don't have a lot of money, you live in a city which is, which is um, well, which is cheap. Or you live in, you know, like open space. You live. I, I've seen pictures of, you know, um, migrants or living in in tunnels or living in parks or living in. Um, if you, I, I'm, I'd really be happy to share this report because uh, it's it shows some really good examples specifically for Italy, because for me the problem is really the inequality between the host population and the migrant population or the migrants in this case um, when it comes to the um, when it comes to the spatial dimension because for example if i think in the burkina faso context or if i think about uganda um, where antonella and me actually started <laughs> our work together um, in a context where the host population actually is facing a lot of challenges as well when it comes to inadequate housing, when it comes to no access to um, to services in, like health services or education, or access to markets, or access to livelihood generation things. Um, the difference to the host population is not that high. And so they're all suffering sort of from the same problems, including the spatial dimension. But if you, in a, in a, so environment like Europe, this inequality is, of course, is enormous because most of us are so used to living in houses which are warm, where we have hot water, where we have a toilet. <coughs> and like the spatial dimension for me also is like, where do you live in the city and how do you live in the city? And which are the areas where you, where you walk around, for example? Because I mean, many of us, it's, it's a question of security as well, no? Um, many of us live in, in areas where there's actually where there's light in public space in the evening. So you know, even as a woman, you feel quite comfortable in, in in areas of the town. While in those areas where migrants live, um, there's obviously no street lights. And so this inequality when it comes to the spatial component, we're used to. You know, we live in areas where I always say I can actually cycle to work. Which is which is great, you know. I don't have to worry about transport. I don't have to worry about um, to pay for my transport. And but if you live outside the city, how do you actually get to work? Because you cannot afford to live close to your your generate your livelihood. Or another example for me is always um, I have connectivity to Wi-Fi because of where I live, and. That is also a spatial dimension because coverage, for example, might not be available or water, like, you know, in, in many, um, many areas in Nairobi, for example, where I used to live, those formal and planned urban <coughs> areas, you have access to water just regularly. But in the informal urban poor settlements, there has to be this truck that actually delivers the water and then you actually pay much more as a poor urban citizen than those people who live already like quite luxury in a in a house where you just access the tap. So all of those things are for me actually the, the spatial um, exclusion of people in vulnerable situations, including migrants. 
Yeah, I understand this point, but uh, I I think that this is something related with uh, the, the infrastructure and the structure and the, and the networks that probably as architects we cannot control or we cannot rule in a way. So it's uh, out of our uh, you know control in a way. So I think that. I was more interested in when you said, um, when you uh, explain um, the spatial dimension of migrant inclusion. So what, what, what do you mean for spatial? So, I mean, according to our tools, uh, what can we do now to, to, to make these spaces of inclusion? Well, one thing is, is really like including migrants into participatory planning processes to just find out as a first step, what is maybe a component when it comes to planning of public space, a component you might miss simply because you don't have that perspective. So, or when it comes to like um, thinking about, of course, low cost housing, um, that is something, you know, like this social mix in society, that is something that, that um, architects, of course, can also, uh, and urban planners can also, of course, um, of course, strongly influence, but then also like the connectivity when it comes to infrastructure. If you do work on planned city extensions, I mean, in Italy, I'm, I'm sure that point is covered. But for example, when I think of Burkina or when I think of Uganda, um, first of all, there's no idea of social mix, but then there's also no mix use. So you might find yourself, you know, in, in a neighborhood which is completely disconnected, but then, of course, it's also just housing. So um, that, that is part of the spatial inclusion, and that is something that architects can actually influence by raising the awareness that, <coughs> and I mean, as I said, I hope in Antonella's course, the mixed use idea is, is, of course, strongly promoted, but it has not actually hit the ground in many countries that I've seen. But if I can also, uh, remind us the experience that we have done in Uganda with Stephanie. For example, we open up a, a, a round table with the local agent to try to understand uh, which kind of public space uh, they had in their mind. And uh, for example, in Africa, uh, I ask, the market is a public space? No, the market is not a public space, it's a private space. Um, they don't have a plaza, for sure, and they have this uh, uh, typology of public space that they name Gazette. And uh, the Gazette actually is a potato field, very huge, but uh, uh, in some case, in some other is uh, a fence area that they would like, uh, they, when we ask which is your need, they started to speak about embellishment. So also the way in which they, they, the terminology that they use, the embellishment of a gazette, that it's something that uh, is a space uh, without any real function, but is a space uh, for, um, for meeting other, other, the other. Uh, and uh, and in this case, uh, um, the Gazette, uh, from my point of view, in that uh, sort of indeterminate, uh, not shape, because the shape and the dimension was quite uh, uh, possible to be recognized, but uh, indeterminate function that reminds uh, our um, Rastro market or places uh, that are not uh, defined in our Western city could be a good uh, way to include the other that usually are afraid of a very structured public space. So, in this case, uh, thinking that Uganda is uh, one of the states in Africa that hosted in a very few times, 1 million of migrants from South Sudan. So they had an um, incredible uh, need of uh, uh, specialization uh, of uh, migrant inclusion using public space. But for us, or for me in particular, uh, it, it was quite tricky to understand uh, the relationship between uh, uh, 
a, ro a main road, uh, a system uh, of uh, um, a, a, a city fabric, uh, in some case planned, but uh, out of the of the main road, absolutely not planned. And not planned means that the water is running everywhere when it's raining. And understand uh, uh, in which way in uh, my discourse, that is a very systematic discourse, is it possible to identify the space for a gazette? Uh, that is a construction. From another, uh, another point of view, I think that your question, Lina, it's super important if we introduce the topic of uh, colonization, because um, uh, push me to think that in the city, and that is another phase of the spatial dimension of um, migration, in the city, the uh, colonization produce space uh, that uh, are the space of the inclusion, but the colonization define also space of the exclusion. For example, places close to the infrastructure or uh, uh, close, uh, and that is the question of Valentina, social justice and the point of Stephanie, social justice doesn't exist if I move the migrant close to the Nile where there is a risk of flood. Uh, so, uh, it's a matter of fact that uh, uh, the colonialist uh, uh, approach define uh, inclusion and exclusion, speaking about spaces. And uh, in this case, uh, understand the, and, and always are physical reasons, because the neglected area are excluded by the colonial way to plan the city. Yeah, exactly. And the place for migrants. So I think that your question is could be related to different scale, uh, 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 the scale of planning, uh, and due to the climate change, it will happen that the cost that right now in in Africa are the best place to live probably. But uh, in the future, uh, the city will 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 retire from the cost since they are the very dangerous places. So my, the question is, uh, what will happen when the climate change uh, will invert the, the, the code of inclusion and exclusion due to the uh, colonialism uh, approach? And that is a part. The other part, uh, uh, for sure, in the experience that we had with, uh, with Stephanie was related to the construction of a public space that was a space for, as a meeting place for different communities. Uh, and in Africa, uh, it's very strong, uh, also the cultural uh, uh, connection. Uh, so we need a space without as a sign of power to, to to, to share with other culture. So it's interesting because the, 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 there isn't only one layer, but a different layer that uh, uh, can allow us to speak about a spatial uh, dimension. And uh, th 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 thank you so much, Antonella. I was, well, wanted just to say, uh, I wrote to Vin Vincent in the uh -huh. meantime, and uh, he sent me his presentation. He said the connection is a bit unstable, but maybe in the remaining time uh, uh, we can try to share it live. Sorry oh, if perfect. I can. So bit, he, uh, can, yeah. he, can, uh, yeah, we... he can speak yeah? with using the telephone. He, yeah, we, we said we would try. Okay. Okay. Can, you, can you unmute yourself? Or... We have also in case a question by Federico Misto. Eh? Yeah, but if but maybe doesn't work with uh, Vincent. Mm -hmm. Okay, see. Federico, can you make your question very quickly? Uh, now Vincent has the mic open. Let's because I didn't see Vincent in any case, but uh, because he wrote me in the the chat. Let's I asked him to unmute. Him. No, I didn't see uh, the connection of uh, Vincent here because. Oh, no, I see. Okay, I can, can you hear me? Yeah. Ah, Charles, you see, yes. what you say? Good afternoon, all. Oh, hi. 
I try to share your slide and then okay. let's see if the, the audio works. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, um, um, everybody. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Stephanie. Uh, I will I like to start by thanking uh, Professor Sarah uh, Sony and also Professor Antonella Conti for inviting uh, uh, me to this um, um, important uh, summer school of the Polytechnic di Milano campus of Piacenza. It's really indeed a great pleasure for me to be with you. Uh, I have had some challenges that is um, due to um, to a rain. There is a big rain here in, uh, in Cameroon. I'm actually in Cameroon. I hope that you are hearing me. Um, I just wanted to, I was invited to talk to you about urban energy uh, solution. I will try uh, with my presentation to uh, share with you some of the key elements that um, have to be taken into consideration when we are considering the issue of energy. I listen with very uh, good attention and interest the presentation made by my colleague uh, Stephanie. And uh, um, some of the points made, some of the points that made that, that presentation are also going to be included in my presentation. We talk about uh, the, the, the importance of planning, uh, planning for everything. Let me start by putting in the context. Uh, we have today, uh, and, and perhaps most importantly in the countries, we have a, a, a rapid uh, population growth and also rapid education. That is taking place mostly in, in Africa and also Southeast Asia. And in America, the world population, yes, you already have this figure 7.6 billion, uh, which also suggests to be 9.7 billion by 2050. And again, you will, you will also know climate change has also been in 2050. So, everything that we are now trying to do is that we have 2050 target very present to us. Um, as we look at the, the, the urban population, we also realize that um, the world, the global world, will uh, have an additional 2.5 billion people that will be living in city uh, compared to the almost 4 billion today of people that are living in cities. Uh, most importantly, point one of the most important point also that we need also to see is uh, related to energy. Um, the demand of energy is growing uh, rapidly, and uh, in some developing countries, we are talking of, of uh, an annual increase of energy demand by seven percent. But uh, when we look at the um, energy uh, uh, generation, we see that energy generation are not increasing uh, with the pace that we we'll want to see. Next slide, please. Next slide. Okay, thank you. Um, so, um, the, the urban energy in the context, the first issue is that our city today consume more energy than any other places uh, on earth. Uh, it is estimated, and this is the data from the International Energy Agency, that 25% of energy uh, uh, are consumed in cities. I think also that 70% of the greenhouse emissions are also emitted from us. Uh, and, and therefore, um, when we look at the economic uh, development, we also realize that 70% of the GDP are produced in city. What does that mean? Mean that if we are to fight for, uh, climate change, city is really the place to start with. At the same time, if we want to fight uh, 
uh, uh, uh, inclusion, exclusion, and also poverty. Uh, we were talking about refugees. Of course, the refugees will move to city. Uh, we realize that all this will happen in cities, and, and therefore we need to put in place elements that would allow us to either generate more energy, because energy is the driver of the development, and also at the same time, we need to put more focus on cities. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, at UN Habitat, I was asked to share with you our experience and methodology in designing um, uh, and promoting sustainable energy in cities. Uh, I, I just want to mention that uh, based on our several years of urban energy, we have come out with six points, six elements. I know that there are different students that are listening to this presentation. Uh, those six points will help you to, um, to develop and plan for and include energy component in your design. And me, and me, special design, and also. Uh, uh, Meaning also so fitting. I know that this summer school is taking place in Pisa, and also you have an area where you are going to test your, your program. Uh, the first point on energy is is about urban planning. Stephanie mentioned the issue of mixity. She also mentioned the issue of 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 the importance of planning in advance so that we avoid that the migrant go and settle in area that are not um, uh, that are not suitable for human uh, uh, consumption or human living. The other point which is important to mention is uh, sustainable mobility. Uh, today, with the energy generation. And also with climate change, we need to reduce the demand for energy. It, it's very important. But at the same time, reducing the demand or, or rather energy uh, consumption, this should not come as the expense of the energy needs or rather the service that we want to achieve. And therefore, uh, given that urban mobility, transport, uh, moving people from one place to another place, consume more energy than, than other sectors, we need to put emphasis on urban mobility, and we need also to encourage public transportation options. The, the third element is on green buildings, or, 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 or rather on, on sustainable building design, or, or also on, on housing. We need to look into the way we design our houses so that they can consume less energy but provide more services that we need. So this is very important. Uh, the fourth point, which is something that 20 years ago nobody will have been talking about, uh, is about energy generation. Today we are talking about city being a place where we can generate energy. And there are a lot of untapped renewable energy potential in cities that could be generated and used for other service to address our energy need. And then and the fifth point is um, waste to energy. We know that uh, the municipal um, waste that is generated in cities can be transformed into energy. I, I know that in Italy, most of the uh, waste processing plant have the waste to energy component in it, and, and this is very important. And the last one is the promotion of efficiency in the use of resources, uh, because we cannot just focus on energy alone. We need to uh, 
to consider other resources, for example, water. How do we use water? Uh, water is, is energy because you need energy to pump water. You need energy to bring water in the cities. So if you reduce your energy, your water consumption, you are also directly um, or indirectly reducing the energy demand that will be needed to pump that water. And then at the same time, you are also making a greater impact of the climate change. Now let's look at this uh, uh, six point individually. Next slide, please. Next slide. In, in the next slide. Uh, this slide show how an urban planning can decide the amount of energy that is consumed in the city. Uh, just by planning, if we plan using a sort of sprawl system where you hello yes if we plan the way we plant our cities will also directly influence the way we consume energy if we plan with um, uh, a very, very sprawl system uh, with one um, one story buildings and making sure that each household has its own uh, plot. At the end of the day, the city will consume more energy than any places. And therefore, we need to put emphasis, we need to densify it. We need to make sure that we densify houses and, and then at the same time, we also Create for open space for garden for trees greenery and so on and so forth. So, uh, uh, sustainable urban planning is a key. It's an entry point. Uh, 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 Professor um, Antonella was talking about colonization. Uh, was talking about how do we colonization of the space? How do we really plan for new spaces? So. This is where we say uh, Vincent, we lost you, I think. Uh, Antonella, do you hear him? Yes, I think that uh, I didn't see his um, connection. Uh, Vincent, are you still there? Uh, he's still in the participant list, but maybe I try to mute and unmute. But it seems that the microphone is on. It seems that, I... that uh, we lost the connection well maybe i just quickly show you the the remaining points uh as slides at least i don't know antonella what do you think or we wait a bit uh, probably we can wait a bit uh, uh trying to uh have his uh his description for sure we can read uh, the slide and um uh, yes, regarding the the first uh, city fabric, uh, uh, that is something that we we study usually uh, also in some discipline uh, that in uh, other university are named urban metabolism uh, unit and try to reduce. Uh, uh the number of street inside the city fabric that is a famous uh, also approach of barcelona and the mega block that barcelona is trying to promote as you know they uh, produce a much more big uh, mega block so the entire serda uh, 
um, block uh, is, is uh, unify, uh, erasing or transform the, the streets that are inside the mega manzana, the, the mega block in uh, cy um, cyclable path uh, or in a street that the car can use only in a specific hour during the day. So that is uh, also a way in which they define the idea of compactness, uh, that it's something that they uh, usually underline and that, for example, for, 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 for me speaking about uh, uh, metropolitan design, uh, uh, instead, the continuity of the huge metropolitan dimension is a matter of fact and is also fundamental because it allows us to introduce the continuity of the green infrastructure. So when we speak about compactness, in, in reality, we are speaking about a, 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 a that particular way to build the block much more than the idea of the città finita, of the uh, Phoenix City, uh, that was a, a sort of a idea of the last uh, century. And the second part uh, regarding uh, sustainable uh, mobility, we spoke a lot with Vincent regarding uh, this uh, uh, idea that, uh, first of all, uh, uh, is related to, and that is uh, again another part that is uh, specific of our uh, physical dimension. Is a matter of fact that the section of the street uh, must change uh, from one side because uh, the transition uh, towards uh, the sustainable mobility will change uh, also. Uh, the furniture, uh, the urban furniture that we will need. Uh, and for example, it seems that uh, we don't need uh, anymore the workspace, uh, but uh, some uh, element that could speed back the, the speed of the car. And from the other side, we need water catchment uh, uh, canals close to the um, uh, section of the, of the road. So for sure, new generation must change uh, that idea, the, the, our traditional idea of the street section. For sure, uh, the electrical mobility will be something uh, absolutely uh, fundamental. Um, we spoke a lot uh, with uh, Vincent Kitio uh, regarding uh, the real uh, availability, for example, of electrical car uh, in some developing countries. Uh, because the infrastructural part that this new mobility needs, uh, it's very, it's much more uh, relevant, costly, and uh, will need a lot of time and project, much more probably that the uh, availability of uh, uh, a sustainable mobility uh, car or uh, or vehicle. Um, so uh, from one side is a physical uh, uh, section of our road, from the other side, uh, a much more optimized idea of the mega block that reduces the number of the street uh, inside the block. From the other side, uh, probably we have absolutely changed our idea of city production, uh, increasing the public uh, uh, transportation uh, system. Uh, and uh, the, this part, uh, I guess that our students in uh, Milano Politecnico uh, are quite uh, aware and they had uh, a lot of uh, courses that uh, improve the train our student in that field uh, so green buildings uh, and uh, also in in our polytechnic uh, a lot of colleagues try also to translate uh, the ancient knowledge regarding the production of humidity uh, the the um, cycle of the of the hair that also we catch from ancient architecture uh, so I think that uh, in particular in Milano Politecnico, 
uh, is not only a matter of new technologies, uh, but uh, we try to figure out another idea of smart city that is not only related to new technical uh, uh, issue and uh, discovery, but is much more related to try to uh, translate and uh, uh, yes, I, I think that the correct uh, uh, operation is a translation of ancient knowledge uh, at another scale. So for sure, we need an improvement of uh, uh, research, uh, but uh, uh, the, it's, it's a knowledge that we could find also in a pre-modern uh, architectures that we have, first of all, to rediscover and, and then to put in place. And uh, that is a point uh, that uh, personally, I think that uh, for us is um, much uh, interesting because uh, probably uh, we didn't reach that awareness in our courses and the idea of the smart grid. So when we spoke about uh, um, uh, mixed uh, use, we also have to take into consideration that right now it's possible to produce energy, to stock energy, and to exchange energy among different functions according to the different hour of the day. And uh, so uh, I think that also this uh, uh, point is uh, really specific and relevant for architecture and urban design disciplines because uh, uh, it's a sort of shift and uh, uh, of our way of thinking that the energy is something that, uh, that doesn't fit with, uh, with our uh, competence because uh, uh, a few days ago we spoke about uh, the archipelago. In this case, uh, what is relevant is that the energy is moving towards uh, an idea of production of energy or, uh, or also clean water in a small uh, uh, loop, a small archipelago, and then uh, the small archipelago can be connected uh, within the main network, metropolitan network of the production of energy. And that, for example, is one point that we discuss uh, a lot with uh, in other occasion with Incensi Kitio, because uh, uh, we have to understand which kind of function could stay together, uh, which is the correct measure of their position, but also how is it possible to prepare this uh, archipelago to be connected with the metropolitan city and the metropolitan network uh, ener energy energy network. And when we speak about uh, energy network, we also speak about uh, um, water. That is super important. Uh, regarding the solid waste management, uh, um, again, I think that Milano Polytechnical is quite uh, uh, prepared and aware uh, to to face uh, these uh, challenges, and um, and in particular, uh, and I connect, I I, I could connect uh, this part also with the part uh, that uh, uh, Stephanie Luz uh, presented before. Milano is quite uh, advanced in that uh, field, uh, not only uh, regarding the the food. Uh, uh, production, but also regarding the food waste, and uh, that is uh, strictly related to the solid waste uh, uh, management. Uh, uh, with uh, Stephanie, Stephanie allowed me to visit uh, uh, an incredible, interesting uh, compound uh, in in um, Berlin. Where starting from the solid waste management, uh, uh, it was possible to produce uh, energy for the electrical car, and in particular, car without the driver, uh, that could take their energy from the solar panel that were also uh, apart. Um, uh, the, the roof uh, uh, of the parking uh, uh, gate. So it was a, a regeneration of a, an industrial compound uh, starting from the solid waste management. Uh, and it was um, 
and it was presented to African uh, administrator uh, of Uganda that they wonder. Uh, that is another point. Uh, how is it possible to share this kind of uh, technique with other uh, country? And the, the, six, this is the last point uh, is uh, that uh, idea that is super uh, that is super important uh, regarding the fact that we have to integrate the different energies, the two water energies, uh, underground and in Piacenza, that is super uh, up to date. Uh, the, the, the surface uh, water, the waste and energy system, uh, conceiving uh, that the, the, our uh, final uh, architectural project, uh, so our building, is a part of this smart grid and is part of that uh, energy production. Is it possible as architect uh, uh, built a space, uh, an architectural space and an urban space uh, that uh, include this uh, kind of technical furniture as a part uh, of our composition? That is, I think, that is something that we must catch uh, from this um, uh, lecture. And so they, oh. Thank you so much, Antonella, for stepping in. I think every everything you said was super interesting and probably would merit a lecture of his own. Uh, uh, I only try to remember what we discussed with Vincent Kitio in other in other uh, occasion. Uh, because uh, it's a field of uh, competence is energy for urban development. So uh, the message is that is not something that is outside our uh, field of action because the city is a complex system. And we have to learn that probably not alone, but uh, uh, sharing co co in a sort of co-construction with other experts, we have to include this uh, this uh, part uh, in in our uh, design. I also would like to remember to our students that uh, in uh, not in Piacenza uh, right now it will be I'm I'm pretty sure, but in um, Politecnico di Milano Campus Leonardo on the other side of the road uh, where there is a uh, old uh, Milano Politecnico campus and in particular. The Natta Pavilion, there is an incredible, super uh, relevant um, lab, uh, Pew Lab, I guess is the name. The, the coordinator is uh, Mariella Levi, and they produce uh, incredible new material, a solar concentrator, uh, a different material. They work a lot with 3D printers. So the capability to, to print with local uh, earth and soil. And, um, but for example, they didn't exchange with us as architect. So I think that we have to start to uh, cross the, the road and uh, start to work with an engineer and in particular the chemical engineer that are developing uh, um, materials that produce energy and that we can start to use in our project. I Vitaccio. Uh, Antonella, I guess we can say, it's Michele, sorry, I cannot uh, open my camera. Uh, I guess we can uh, also share with students as the other uh, lectures, the slides also by Vincent, so they can uh, be aware yeah. better of the, sure. of the very important things you have, uh, you have, uh, we have uh, uh, said for, for him. And uh, well, if uh, there are no other comments, uh, and if you agree, uh, I think well, it's fantastic to close with these two lectures, our uh, cycle, uh, our series of uh, a lecture with uh, UN Habitat um, uh, experts and uh, colleagues. So I think uh, from all of us, also from the coordination, as well as from uh, Antonella and her team, uh, uh, great uh, thanks. Today is a connection of everybody. Yeah. Very low, and we are not in Africa. That's it. But I think Michele yeah, wants. Is a, is a traveling, I know. Yeah. That. Yeah, but anyways, I think he wanted just to, to thank you, Antonella, especially, and all the organizations. Maybe Michele is still trying to speak, but.
he doesn't manage to. Yeah, yeah just uh, we, we think that um, the contribution by UN Habitat was pressure for our uh, workshop and we thank you a lot again for making it possible and thank you again uh, uh, Stephanie and uh, Vincent even if it's not with us anymore in this connection but thank you for your contribution and all your very interesting inputs. We, we hope the students will uh, take uh, them in account and treasure them also for their future careers. So thank you very much, Stephanie. In thank case you. there are any questions, please don't worry, share my contact details or share the presentation, or if you need any references, happy to provide. And thanks Antonella for always including us because um, I think for us, the preparations for those um, presentations is also very much pushing us forward in our work as well. <laughs> Thank it's you. a lot of uh, work for you, I know. Thank you very much uh, for everything, and uh, we will see very, very soon. Ciao, grazie.